that. Really accurate. It is, yeah. I've, I've sighted it in and stuff, but. Pretty little gun. Lightweight, too. Dude, it's awesome. Cold on my cheek with this uh, 20 <laughs> below, 20 degree temperature. I think it's gotta be colder than 20 degrees, dude. Oh, crap, man. Like. All my hands are numb. Yeah, I mean, it's. I mean. It's gotta be single digits. It feels like it right now. We've dropped 10 degrees since we've been out here. That's brutal. Yeah, it's crazy. How's it going, guys? Coming at you with a review that I've been wanting to do for quite some time. Ever since I found out that Caltech came out with an upgraded version of their Sub 2000, I knew I wanted to get my hands on one. I knew I wanted to do a review for you guys. I've had my original Gen 1 for over four years now, and it's been one of my favorite guns I've ever owned, but I've never actually sat down and done a review for you guys. So that's going to change today. I've had this in plenty of videos, but never done a review. So let's go ahead and get to it. The Caltech Sub 2000 is a pistol caliber carbine, meaning that, for those of you guys that don't know, it's a carbine or a rifle that shoots a pistol caliber. In this case, it's the 9mm. So all three of these guns shoot the exact same round, which is that 9mm. You know, the pistol caliber carbine is one of the hot, the most hotly debated categories of firearms. You know, it's very litmus. You either love them or you hate them. <laughs> and there's a lot of pointed opinions um, uh, for and against. You know, anytime that I roll a pistol caliber carbine in front of the camera, uh, there's always really heavy weighted opinions. And, you know, I, I'm one that's very open-minded when it comes to firearms. And I don't really pigeonhole myself in. And I don't really consider myself a fanboy um, necessarily. Um, but uh, I really like the pistol caliber carbine. I think that there's a lot of roles that it plays that fills a lot of niches. Um, I do see the validity on either side of the argument, and we'll talk a little bit about that um, as the review goes on. So let's talk about some of the features of the Kel-Tec Sub-2000. One of my favorite features, okay, is this right here. The fact that it can collapse down into a very compact package. So overall length really here is a little over 16 inches, and that's because the barrel is a, is a, 16, and a, half, a 16 and a quarter inch barrel. But what's cool is you get an overall, when it's fully open, you get a compact package. When it's fully closed, you get a really, really compact package. And what that that does is it makes it a concealable rifle. You can throw this into a laptop bag, into a backpack, underneath a car seat, uh, you name it, you can probably put, uh, fit the, the Kel-Tec Sub-2000 in. So it's it's uh, the ability to have a rifle in such a compact package is really, really nice and it's one of my favorite features about the Kel-Tec Sub-2000. So as it goes on here, we're going to compare and contrast between the, the Gen 1 and the Gen 2. So we're going to kind of uh, kind of do that as the review progresses because there's really no way of no better way of showing you guys the features than by doing that. If we start towards the back of the gun, uh, we can see that the Gen 2 is really improved on the buttstock over the, the Gen 1. They've made it more ergonomic. One of the things that I've noticed about shooting the kel originally is that the, the sights are sometimes hard to acquire because of uh, the way the buttstock is. The buttstock is very, very short, and so it doesn't fit in the pocket of your shoulder very easily. And what they've done on the Gen 2, they've made they made the ergos a little bit better, or the angle better on the back of the stock, and they made it a bit taller. So what it does, it allows that pocket to be achieved a lot easier, and it's going to make it a lot easier for, especially for newer shooters, to shoot the Sub 2000. They've also improved the sling capabilities on the stock with the Gen 2. They've also put a uh, Picatinny rail on the bottom here. Um, you know, for the most, for for practical purposes, you know, it's not really going to serve a ton. But what you can do is you can put a sling mount on the bottom of the the buttstock there, and so that'll give you an, an extra sling option. They've also changed it up so that you can actually adjust the length of pull on the Gen 2. Now overall, when it, in its fully com collapsed state, the Gen 2 uh, overall length of pull is a little bit smaller or shorter than that of the Gen 1. And, and I actually uh, like that. I like that shorter length of pull. I don't have really long arms, and so short, to me, shorter length of pull is, is usually more ergonomic. But the Gen 2 gives you the option of extending out a little bit further um, over that of the Gen 1. So it's a really really nice upgrade that they've done there. The actual latches when, when the gun's closed is a little bit different. On the Gen 1, it latches onto the front sight. The Gen 2, it latches on the front of the Picatinny rail on the handguard. So it's a little bit different, but the idea is the same. Moving forward, the charging handle is a little bit different uh, between the two, um, just different kind of looks. Um, overall, it's the same in function. So coming forward, let's talk about the grips here. 
Now, the, uh, the, the Gen 2 that I have, this particular one is a Glock 19 version, meaning that it will accept Glock 19 Max. So it'll short, accept the shorter Glock 19 Max, okay? Now, on the my original one, this is a Glock 17 version. So what you can see is you can see that the magazines are a little bit longer on the Glock 17. This is a 17 round mag and the Glock 19 is a, uh, is a 15 round mag. So this one will not accept the same magazines as this one, but this one will accept the same magazines that this one will, okay? Hopefully that makes sense. So this one will accept anything from a Glock 19 mag this size and up. This one will accept anything from a Glock 17 mag and up. Now I've really thought about modifying my original Glock 1, Gen 1, uh, to, to accept the Glock 19 Max. I still plan on doing that. Uh, so that's just a future project that I just haven't gotten around to doing because I want to make it the lowest, I want to make it compatible with the lowest common denominator. And in my case, it's a Glock 19. Now, DocTac Mom runs a Glock 22 that's been converted to, to 9mm that takes Glock 17 Max. And so for her, her the, uh, the, the original Sub 2000 is compatible with her Glock 17. But I want to make it so that we can utilize the same mags all the way around. The only the only uh, downside would be she can't run my Glock 19 mags, but I can always run Glock 17 mags in my in my pistol. So I want to make it kind of the lowest common denominator. Make make all of them be able to accept uh, those those certain magazines. While we're on magazines, let's talk about capacity now. One of the cool things about Kel the Keltec Sub 2000 is they they are they come out in different versions. This particular one is the Glock version, so it takes Glock magazines. But I know they also make one that takes the Smith and Wesson M&P mags, and they make one that also takes the Beretta 92 mags. So you're just going to have to check on Keltec's website to see uh, which configurations there are. I think there's even more than that, uh, so they'll their website will will let you know. But uh, I really prefer the Glock 19 mags mainly because of of the readily availability of the Glock magazines and their different configurations. So you have you have the the 17 round mags here, but then you can also get the Glock 18 round 18 mags, which are the 32 round stick mags, which are my favorite for running in the Keltec Sub 2000. I also have a like an SGM, I think it's SGM, uh, a 50 round drum mag. <laughs> Now, it's not super practical um, and quite heavy, so uh, it's more for fun rather than anything, but it just kind of gives you an op it gives you an idea of the options that are available for capacity for these guns. But for standard capacity, I really, really like the 32 round stick mags. The magazine releases are the same for both guns. I find them to be very adequate. Uh, they are drop-free magazines on both guns. Uh, they don't come flying out, but they will drop free with gravity. So that's very, very nice. They're very adequate there. The safeties are crossbar safeties, meaning that uh, you know you you flip them left for safe and flip them right for for fire. So pretty uh, pretty uh, standard fare. Uh, the detents are are adequate on those. I don't think you're gonna inadvertently actuate them uh, so the safeties are are pretty good that way coming forward let's talk about the trigger now now the triggers Keltec uh, advertises as a 9 to 10 pound trigger and that's about what I think that they run I, I really think they run right around the 9 pound mark and they feel like a double action trigger pull one of the things I didn't note about the trigger was that the trigger between the two are feels exactly the same. I don't feel any difference between the Gen 2 and the Gen 1 triggers. And, and from, from what I understand, I think they're identical in uh, in their construction internals. So I don't think I don't I don't think there should be a difference between the triggers at all in the Gen 1 and 2. So one of the things about shooting the Keltec Sub 2000 is it feels like there's a speed limit placed on the gun, and there's there's two reasons for that. One is the trigger. the 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 double action trigger pull makes it so it's really hard to shoot the gun fast, like really fast. Um, but uh, what also contributes to uh, that that uh, speed limit is the fact that um, th these guns weigh four and a quarter pounds, which is awesome. Really, really lightweight. But what's also cool is that they are blowback actions, meaning that uh, the round, when it's in the chamber, once the bullet leaves, the expended gases that uh, are generated shoves the the uh, the bolt rearward and cycles the action. Okay, and so. 
what that what that requires in a blowback action is it requires the bolt to be kind of fairly chunky and heavy it makes it so that the that that weight of the the actual or the mass of the bolt will keep the bolt closed long enough for the barrel to actually or the bolt to actually leave the barrel and so it what what it also does though is it adds most of the weight of the rifle towards the back in this particular case so in the sub 2000s case, what it does is it adds a lot of the mass of the gun in the rearward position. So really most of the weight of the gun is from here backwards. And so what it does is it makes the front of the gun very light. So that's kind of unique to the, the, the sub 2000. Most guns are heavier forward. And so what it does is it makes it so you can almost shoot the gun one handed because most of the, the weight's back against your shoulder. But what it also does when you're trying to shoot fast is that the gun likes to the muzzle likes to rise a lot in this gun when you're shooting it and because of that it it's hard to shoot fast because you have to get back onto the the target and so the the double action trigger pull as well as the 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 mass being behind the the action really makes it so that the gun's a little harder to shoot fast now you can still shoot it fast you just can't shoot it AR15 fast it's uh you just can't quite kick the rounds out as fast as you would otherwise. But you know, really it's adequate. The, I don't wanna make it sound like you can't shoot it fast, but it's just not as quick as, as some other carbines. All right, now how the rifle is broken down is when you open it, okay, so in its fully open position, what you do is you actually grab the trigger guard, pull the trigger guard down, and when it's down, you can actually break the rifle down. And that's the exact same uh, between the two. They have not changed that at all, so it's the same way. The only caution that I would give to you guys is that when you're, when you're uh, opening it up, keep your finger and the meat of your hand uh, clear of that spot because it will pinch you. I've been pinched a bunch of times uh, when I'm opening the rifle, so that will pinch. But uh, but yeah, they they break down and assemble the exact same way. Now while I'm back here um, in the middle of the gun, let's talk about polymers. Okay. Now the original Gen One, the polymers really. <laughs> Kel-Tec's original polymers leave something to be desired. They're kind of a matte finish. They they don't look uh, super high quality. Uh, there's nothing wrong with them. I mean, I think they're they're adequate, but uh, they just don't look as good. They don't feel as good either. But these new uh, Gen 2s come out with a lot nicer polymers. Now, I think the Gen 1s, they, they, they wear really well. So you don't get a lot of marring marks on the original polymer. This one, I think you'll get a lot more uh, shining marks on the polymer. But the overall feel of the polymer is a lot better, and I really think that, um, that it makes the gun look a lot better. All right, now moving forward, let's talk about one of the biggest upgrades of the Gen 2, and that is the handguard. You know, the handguard is incredibly ergonomic on the Gen 2. You have pick rails on the bottom and on the top, and then you have M -lock, uh, Magpul M-Lock slots on the side. Um, as you can see right here, I have a uh, TLR1HL uh, from Streamlight uh, mounted up front. Phenomenal light, but it's mounted on a Picatinny rail uh, that is maglock uh, compatible. So it really makes customizing your your Keltec a lot easier. With the Gen 1, there's whole websites out there devoted to modifying your Gen 1 Sub 2000. And the reason why is because there's really no way to mount anything to this original handguard. Um, they sell uh, they sell quad rails for it. Um, there's different companies that do aftermarket uh, rails, but but anything that you've wanted to do on this, you have to pretty much drill holes, cut cut uh, sections out, do what do all of that yourself. And so there's whole websites devoted to actually how to do that. But with uh, with the Gen 2, it makes it as easy as pretty much any other Air 15 out there. You just add whatever components you want onto it, and it really makes customizing your your Keltec Sub 2000 a lot lot better. And it's also a lot thinner. And so if for those of you guys that like to run thumb over bore, you're really going to love this uh, this handguard up front. Um, I don't really like to do that, but I will run my thumb right at the top of the the rail and so that really helps a lot it makes it feel a lot better when you're shooting
All right, so let's back up a little bit and talk about the metal finishings on the, the Gen 1 and Gen 2. Now, the Gen 1, the metal finishing on this is really just standard bluing. And, you know, bluing has been around for a really, really long time, um, but it's just not the most durable uh, finish. It's going to rust out without care. Um, um, it's not going to, to uh, stand up to, um, you know, to Mars and stuff as easy. And uh, But, you know, it's okay, but it's not the greatest. What you can get with the Gen 1 is they're also have a hard chrome version which is a really really desirable version because it does give you that corrosion resistance and a little bit uh, nicer overall uh, finish but with the gen 2 what they've done is they've actually done nitriding and what I love about the nitriding is that uh, it's a it's more superior for for corrosion resistance and it's also superior for wear uh, inside of the barrel on the Caltech I believe is, is also nitrided so you're gonna get better wear and better uh, barrel life out of the barrel because of that and just overall I think it's a lot better uh, uh, finishing work on the metal uh, with the gen 2 all right, so let's talk about one of the biggest uh, gripes that people have with the Gen 1 kel Sub-2000, and that really is the front sight. The front sight is all polymer with the Gen 1, and what it also has is it has this, uh, the, the, the front sight post is this clear, brittle plastic on the front, and this you can see the adjustment knobs there are of the same same material. And that's one of the biggest problems I've had with, with uh, the Gen 1, is just getting the thing zeroed and adjusted is a pain in the butt with the original uh, Sub 2000. And I've always, I've always worried that I'm gonna over tighten the screws and snap that uh, center post. And so uh, that's one of the biggest downsides to the Gen 1. Now what they've done to remedy that in the Gen 2 is they've made the front side assembly all metal. Really, really nice. Um, it's all metal housing and it has, what it has in it is it has a AR-15 standard front sight post. And what's nice about that is you can you can swap them out, you can change them out, do do different things with it. The mechanism that actually adjusts the um, the the windage on the front sight is a little hokey in my opinion. It's the 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 actual adjustment knob right here uh, moves very easily. The detents are very light, and so I'm afraid that I'm going to inadvertently change it a little bit. Uh, and the other thing is it's a spring-loaded system on the inside. When I first got the gun, the spring was all the way to the one. One side and it took me you know I had to adjust it out and now it's fine but it still wiggles a little bit and I'm afraid that that the the zero is gonna shift a little bit on it it's just a fear of mine right now I haven't actually seen any shifting in zero but that's something to be aware of uh, another thing that I've seen criticism of the front side on the Gen 2 is the fact that this whole front of sight assembly is threaded onto the barrel. So the barrel is threaded, uh, this front of sight assembly threads on, and then it's held in place by a set screw. And you can see the set screw right there under the adjustment knob. And I've, I've heard that people are having problems with sights coming you know, loose and shifting and rotating out of place. And I really think that I've, I've theorized a, a solution for this. Um, I'm, I'm aware of this, and I think that uh, it's something that I'm keeping an eye on because if it happens to me, this is what I'm going to do. What I'm going to do is I take the front assembly uh, side assembly off, red lock tight the threads, put it back on, and then probably blue lock tight the actual uh, uh, set screw. That really should take care of any problems with that front sight moving around on you. But overall, the front sight on this is by far an improvement over the Gen 1. Now, coming forward a little bit, one, that, one thing that's also really cool is that the muzzle is threaded. So I, I believe this is one half by 28 um, threads on that. Um, and you're going to want to use, you know, again, obviously, you're going to want to use a 9mm, uh, if you put a muzzle device on there, make sure that it's 9mm compatible. Because half by 28s are usually standard on most AR-15s. And they're 22, most of the stuff out there is 22 caliber. So just a word of warning, I know that's kind of like, duh, but you never know. <laughs> So, but what's cool about the, the muzzle being threaded is you can also run the, the Sub-2000 suppressed. And the original one, I've seen guys that have actually taken the front sight off, replaced them with different, uh, different style front sights, and actually threaded the, the barrel to run suppressed. So I have seen suppressed uh, uh, Gen 1s, but it's ready for suppression right out of the box with the Gen 2, and that is really, really nice. 
Coming back, the rear sight on the Gen 2 is exactly the same as the rear sight on the Gen 1. Some people criticize that it's plastic and that it'll break off. I know that there are replacement parts out there where you can actually put a metal insert in there and actually have a metal rear sight, but I don't really think it's an issue. I don't think it's going to be a problem as long as you're, you're cautious and careful with it. Another improvement that they've made in the Gen 2 too, is they've actually made the uh, the ejection port 40% larger. Okay, now one of the things I've noticed when it comes to reliability with the Gen 1 is that uh, most of the failures that I have with the Gen 1 is a uh, failure to eject fully. So what happens is the brass as it's coming out, it gets caught by the bolt coming back forward and stove pipes. And I think that's the reason why they've they've made the ejection port larger on the Gen 2 is because that way it allows the uh, the brass, the spent brass, to eject and clear the rifle easier. Because like I said, that's the majority of the failures that I see with the Gen 1. You know, reliability when it comes to the Gen 1 has been adequate. I, I get, it's usually about 1 in 300 rounds that will actually jam up on me. Uh, and that's usually the case with those, those you know, like I said, those stove pipes. I did, however, have one failure uh, with the Gen 2. Now I've put about 350 or more rounds through the actual Gen 1 or Gen 2, uh, but but the very first mag that I ran was Winchester White Box 115 grain uh, full metal jackets in the gun, and what I actually had was I had a failure to feed. So I had one round that kind of got stuck as it was going into the chamber, and I actually shaved a part of the the brass casing off. So I don't know exactly where it got caught at but it wouldn't uh, chamber. And so I kicked that out and then I ran another 300 and some odd plus rounds through it without a single problem. I've run uh, spear gold dot hollow points through it. These are my hand, uh, my hand loads, okay, so the 124 grain uh, spear gold dot with uh, unique powder behind it, I think, with multiple different ki uh, kinds of brass. I ran 200 rounds of the aluminum, the federal aluminum full metal jacket stuff. I know, I know that uh, they say in the first one, the, the original Caltech is not to, sh to shoot uh, the uh, aluminum uh, case stuff, which I really don't. This one I ran 200 rounds with it, no problem whatsoever. I also ran uh, federal, uh, just federal ammunition, uh, full metal jackets, and again that Winchester white box. So I've put over 350 rounds through the gun and just one failure, and it was in that first, very first magazine. Um, and that's without any, that's with factory lube. I went through and, and just ran a bore snake down the, the bore, but I ran factory lube for the majority of those, those rounds and had zero issues with it. So I think overall reliability is adequate and I expect to see a little bit better reliability with the Gen 2s because of that enlarged ejection port. Another interesting thing to note about uh, the differences between these two is one of the cool things about the Gen 1 is it's always had a very different kind of recoil. Uh, again, it's blowback action, uh, but what it does, it feels like almost like you're launching rockets out the front of the, uh, the barrel because it has a very slow recoiling pattern with my Gen 1. So you fire and it feels like you can feel the bolt coming back and slingshotting forward. So it's really interesting. It's a very slow recoil, not sharp at all. And that's one of the nice things, that, that's one of the reasons why Doctac Mom loves this rifle is because it recoils so very softly. Now the Gen 2, however, is a little different. It has a much sharper recoil pattern okay you can feel the bolt coming back and going forward but it's very very quick very very sharp whereas this one is slow and subtle uh, neither one of them kicks hard at all okay the the amplitude of the kick is very 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 minimal um, but uh, but this one has a tendency to, sh to recoil sharper and this one has a tendency to recoil slower and uh, and softer overall. So that's just kind of interesting. I don't know if kel running different spring rates or whatever between their rifles. I'm not sure if that's the case or not, but uh, it could very well be. Takedown of these rifles is very, very similar. What you do is you drive the pins in the back here out, and then you remove the, the little polymer section, take the spring out, pull the bolt to the back, pull the uh, actual um, bolt the charging handle out of it, and then you slide the the uh, bolt and the bolt's carrier, you slide the bolt and the bolt carrier out the back. And that's pretty much it. Other than that, you can collapse it down, uh, 
clean your barrel straight out. You can scrub inside of the, the tube here and get inside the chamber and scrub that, or get inside the, uh, the action there and scrub a little bit inside of there. But for the most part, they're pretty simple in construction, which I think is what, one of the things that's gonna lend itself to the overall durability of the rifle. So where do I see, what roles do I see the kel Sub-2000 really excelling in in real life? Well, I'll tell you right now, for me, the, the kel Sub-2000 is a fantastic option for survival. Again, look at how small this thing will collapse down to. Very, very, very small, fits in a backpack, it's very lightweight at four and a quarter pounds. You know, it's just a really, really portable rifle. And I think as a survival rifle, I think that, that bodes really, really well. The other thing that's really nice is again that interchangeability between magazines and uh, ammunition between your pistol and your and your rifle. You know, I know that again. There's a lot of people that argue against the the pistol caliber carbine, but consider for a moment though that pistols are are difficult to shoot. They take a lot of time and a lot of practice to master. And whereas you put a rifle in the hands of a beginner and you'll have them hitting steel at 50 yards without with minimal minimal time behind the rifle. Uh, rifles are just there's more points of contact, it's uh, easier to stabilize and it's just a lot easier to shoot accurately. And so if you take a pistol caliber and put it in the rifle, you're gaining more accuracy overall and when it comes to the sub 2000 accuracy should be uh you know adequate you know i i haven't really placed these a lot on paper i've done some i've done some shooting at 25 yards and i and i can group a little over an inch at 25 yards with uh with the um, you know if i'm rested with the iron sights and to me that's more than adequate especially for the fact that this really is a short range weapon it's really not designed to be shooting out a really really long range and so but again, as a survival rifle, you know, being able to carry one type of magazines with one ammunition and be able to switch it between your pistol and your, your rifle, to me, is a huge advantage. But when we're talking from a ballistic standpoint, taking a 9mm out of a pistol, you're going to generate somewhere in, in the vicinity of 300 to 400 foot-pounds of energy. Whereas if you take this same cartridge and you fire it out of a carbine length barrel, you're going to get somewhere in the vicinity of 400 to almost 600 foot-pounds of energy. So you're getting a, a large increase in the, the velocity and energy that you're seeing when you're firing it, firing it out of a, a carbine. Now I know that that is not the same as a rifle cartridge, I realize that. But you are getting some ballistic advantage over the handgun. And when it comes to hollow points, when we talk about hollow points, when we talk about terminal uh, performance of a hollow point, you actually um, will get um, more expansion and less penetration in a carbine than you will in a pistol. Uh, mainly because when, when you have a higher velocity and that round hits, it's going to cause more violent expansion, which is going to kind of put on the brakes and it's going to keep that bullet from, from penetrating as far. So you'll have less um, worries with over penetration with the carbine than you will with a pistol. And when it comes to a home defense situation, that is actually uh, an advantage, not a disadvantage. And it overall improves the stopping power that the, the cartridge, the pistol cartridge actually has. The other thing I want you to consider when it comes to the next role, which is the home defense role that I really placed the Sub-2000 in, is that when you're firing a, um, a, a pistol caliber, you're burning up most of the powder inside of the barrel and thus carbine length barrel. Whereas you'll get unburnt powder on the outside of the pistol. And so your muzzle blast and report that you're getting is a lot less with this over that of a pistol and way, way less uh, over that of a rifle cartridge. If you guys have not fired a rifle cartridge indoors, um, I really I really uh, suggest that you guys get some, some um, actual experience shooting an AR-15 or any other rifle inside of an enclosed space. It makes a huge, huge difference. The concussion and the report is is by far multiplied inside that enclosed space, and that is not ideal for home defense. Now, granted, you can suppress those things and you can remedy that in other ways, but with the pistol caliber carbine, it automatically does that because it's burning all the powder on the inside. And so, for a home defense situation, you know, pistol caliber carbines can actually do really well. Now, in the sub 2000s case. 
Because, again, this is only a four and a quarter pound rifle, and most of the weight is in the rear of the rifle, it makes it so that you can hold the gun up with one hand, and it makes that, that you can maneuver the gun very, very quickly. And because its overall length is very short, it makes it for a very maneuverable uh, carbine inside of an enclosed space like your home. And I think that gives advantage over other types of firearms, like a shotgun, for instance. You know, lo a lot longer overall length um, and also more, more weight. Uh, these things are just super fast to bring into action. So there's really three roles that I really see the kel Sub-2000 really shining in. One is, is as a survival rifle. Uh, two as a uh, vehicle gun because this is so compact you know you really can put it into a vehicle it's just uh, it saves space it's really really nice um, it's also a very easily concealed rifle so you know uh, uh, as a concealed rifle on your person that would be a nice option as well and also in my opinion it's a great option for home defense so for me, the kel Sub-2000 is a really versatile gun and it's something that I really, really enjoy. And as a recreational gun, it's super fun. I mean, at 20, 21 cents a round, you know, you can shoot a lot cheaper than um, other cartridges out there. And I really think that, uh, that it's just a fun, fun gun to shoot. Anyway, guys, if you have any questions or comments about anything you've seen in the video about the Gen 2 or the Gen 1 or anything else you've seen or discussed, uh, feel free to leave them in the comment section down below and I'll try to get back to you. Don't forget to like the video, guys, if you do like what you see. And, and don't forget to subscribe to the channel for more reviews just like this in the future. You can follow me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Google+. Really, though, Instagram is the place to be if you want to follow me outside of YouTube. I'm the most active there. Uh, but guys, I really, really appreciate you guys watching, and we'll catch you guys next video. See ya.